dann ist es so. Ich verstehe immediately, I put on my so eine connection to the person speaking, that people pay more attention. And attention is what actually counts more than anything else uh, in whether you will get anything out of this complicated talk or not. <laughs> so what I want to do is, is start it, I guess, here, like that. OK. Um, yes. 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 I should have pushed that button earlier. Yes. All right. There we go. Um, I want to talk about how you can, all right, yes, uh, you've just listened to a lot, lot of things about uh, headphones. In fact, when I came in, somebody was saying, you know, none of our subjects uh, uh, got any frontal localization from any of the uh, HRTFs we tried. Um, to me, that's, that actually invalidates the whole thing. I mean, if you can't get a system which gives you frontal localization, um, and you need head tracking to get the brain to say, well, I'm going to forget about the fact that this is totally artificial, and I'm going to make the image come down. And then it actually works OK. And I'm not trying to say that virtual reality is silly, because it actually works. And you can get a good psychological opinion out of that. But there's a lot of people who want to use HRTS for actually some kind of research. Um, I'm particularly interested in concert hall research. So I'm going to motivate this talk by just talking a little bit about Tapia Lopki. And um, what Lopki is finding is that proximity, that's the sense that a, a voice is actually close to you, speaking to you in some way, as I am doing to you right now, is actually the most important, possibly the most important criterion for what makes a good concert hall or a poor one. When you feel that the, the musicians are actually talking to you, or in a, on a stage performance that they're actually talking to you and they're not somewhere else in a kind of reverberant space, you pay more attention. You get more emotion out of it. OK, and that's really important. Um, well, what is audio uh, proximity? Well, it's the sense that you can actually sonically detect that something is close to you in some sense. And the interesting thing about that perception is you have to shut your eyes to hear it. If you're in a concert hall and you can see people sawing away, you'll, and you can localize them visually, you'll say, I can localize these perfectly, I must be hearing it. You'll never know what your ears are hearing until you shut your eyes. And then it can be very different. It might take five minutes, but it will be very different. Okay, to study laboratory, uh, in, in proximity laboratory, we have to be able to produce it. We have to be able to reproduce it. And if we're doing a binaural recording, we have to be able to record it. And so that, those are the things you need to know. And um, almost all current systems, for example, ambisonics, we just heard this morning that ambisonics at high frequencies have aliasing problems, and ambisonics at low frequency have problems with the room that you're in and other kinds of problems. That's what Vile Popka said. He's right. Um, um, a, a guy I, I met named uh, Burkholz, uh, who was uh, one of Flowers' last graduate students at the ICA, is building a 42-channel um, uh, third-order ambisonic system. I say 42. Why isn't 32 good enough? He says 32 has too much spatial aliasing above 2,000 hertz, which is where this proximity uh, perception occurs. Mm -hmm. And he says, so I've, I've tripled the number of speakers in the, in, the, in the horizontal plane in the front, and then it works, OK? Well, take his word for it. Um, uh, of course, wave field synthesis, uh, synthesis is only two-dimensional. Nobody's making a three-dimensional. We'll look at about that. And that has spatial aliasing above two kilohertz also. Um, but I want to just, dem uh, when I study a concert hall, what's really interesting to me is this business of, of proximity. And proximity and localization are very sharply, uh, uh, carefully uh, tied together. And to test the concert hall, I do this these days. And I just set these up here so you get an idea of what, what that is. Mm -hmm. And 
Hopefully that will work. Okay, this is two violins. You should be able to tell which violin is on which side, at least the people in the front, really. Mm -hmm. And as you walk back, you get to a very distinct distance where you can no longer do it. And that I call the limit of localization distance. And in doing a concert hall, first I set this up on stage, and then I just walk around the room. And you can tell where you can localize and where you can't. Inside that circle is where the expensive seats will be, or are, or typically they are. And outside that circle, they're much deeper, and I don't like sitting there. Okay. So that's enough of this. I just wanted you. To... Oh, that's. Sorry about that. All right. I don't know why that's happening, but I'm not going to worry about it. Um, so I just want to let you know that that's really important. Um, and I'm going to go a little bit further to say, well, okay. If you want to study concert halls with binaural technology, which in my opinion is the only valid one, I mean, if you can actually make it work, you have a representation of a particular sound in a particular seat, and you, if you can reproduce it correctly, you can A-B that with another seat or another hall. And if you get it right, you know you're right. It's not like an ambisonic system where you go and say, oh, that's pretty good. Um, well, it's pretty good, good enough. How do you know? In fact, Tapioloki has this wonderful system, which I think is wonderful, but I don't think he, it's not been proven. All I know is when I listen to it, it sounds like a concert hall. Mm -hmm. That concert hall, I don't know. But you can prove it with binaural technology. Well, Manfred Schroeder, who you should all know about, mathematician, Bell Labs physicist, um, decided in, in the 1970s to prove it with binaural technology. So he had a dummy head. You can see his dummy head there. It looks an awful lot like mine. Um, which you'll see in a minute, and he played it back with crosstalk cancellation measured at his subject's eardrums. So you put the head in a clamp, you put steel probes against the eardrums, you measure the crosstalk between two loudspeakers, you invert everything mathematically, and that duplicates the eardrum pressure, not the entrance of the ear canal, but the eardrum pressure of that subject exactly. This system should have worked. He made two big mistakes. One, he made his reference lateral. He, he, uh, he used for the dummy head, to make the dummy head, he equalized it for a lateral sound source. This is really silly, and lots of people do it. What's the most important dimension or direction if you're trying to reproduce the sound? The front. Why is the HRTF from the front the most complicated HRTF in the human head? Why? because you need to know the elevation precisely, so you need a very complicated HRTF to do that. If you want to make this system work, you have to normalize it to the front. What you're really doing then is normalizing the system to a particular listener's HRTF, and that system will do it, but Schroeder didn't. And his other big mistake, which is an even bigger mistake, is he decided not to use an orchestra, but two loudspeakers on stage reproducing a stereo recording that the BBC made on tape. Okay, and that is not capable of reproducing proximity because there's too many instruments all playing at once in that, and they all interfere with each other, and it just, it completely eliminates the phases that cause the proximity. Interestingly enough, Edison knew all about how to make proximity. You have a single loudspeaker for a single source and a single microphone for that same source. And he did it in 1916 with this thing called the diamond disc recorder. I heard one of these once in a museum. It was absolutely lifelike. That woman was standing right in front of me singing. He did live versus recorded, recorded, and they were fantastic. And people think they can't believe it these days, but those things worked. All right, well, this is, this is Tapioloki's setup. He's using one source, one speaker for every instrument. Here's a Blauert's uh, example of how not to do the playback. Um, and <laughs> if you want to equalize at the eardrum for playback, this is the way to do it. Um, I've been doing this for years. 
Um, these are probes back going back to the 1980s. They're soft. You can stick them on the eardrum. They don't hurt. You can equalize your, um, your, your, your own HRTS, and then you can equalize the headphones. The picture on the left, uh, on your, uh, your right here, shows the probe in place and, a, and an earphone on top of my ear. I'm measuring the earphone response at the eardrum. That's a, a good way to do it, but there's an easier way. I'm going to go back to the dummy head. This is my dummy head. Um, this is how I record. Um, that dummy head has my own pin it, it has my own ear canals, it has my own eardrum, and it has my own eardrum impedance. I made some effort to put that in, so I can measure a headphone on that and get the right result. There's also a sound field microphone there, so I know where each reflection comes. I'll get back to that in a minute. Now, this is what I was going to talk about. I, th that was all introduction. How am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. I'll for an introduction. Okay. Um, there's a way of doing this really easy. But the reason that you have to do it is that individual equalization from the headphone to your eardrum is where the missing link is. That's what you need to get right. Why? Because the ear canal resonances that happen between here and your eardrum are very complicated and very individual. In fact, there's an NEC paper in my references in the preprint which proposes using eardrum resonances as fingerprints. Okay, if you can measure those things, you can tell who, whose ears they are. It's a pretty high accuracy. All right, um, and I'm going to demonstrate what happens if you don't correct for those uh, ear canal resonances. First of all, anything you do with a headphone will change them because the impedance at the entrance to this surface is very important to their operation. Okay, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate this by playing ten, a one second of paint noise followed by five seconds of what one of ten individuals at Rensselaer University heard from a Sennheiser 600 headphone. Okay, it's my 600 headphone. It's the same one for each listener, and they all had a very different timbre. So, um, for, so you get five seconds of pink noise. Can you turn it up? That's me. That's pink. That's Anthony. That's pink. That's Ben. That's Cameron. Cameron could use those folks. <laughs> One out of five. This is Jonas Brass. I mean, he's German. <laughs> Misha. Paul. Paul's pretty good. Not bad. That means good. Corbin. Poor Corbin. This is Wesley. Now, how many of you Sorry, would mix... Red and blue are left and right. Huh? Red and blue are left and yes. right. Yes. Yeah. How many of you would mix a recording with this pair of headphones, <coughs> given that data? I leave that open. All right. Well, okay, now we get to uh, conventional theory. The conventional theory is that if you have a, 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 an echo chamber and you make a perfectly uniform sound all around the head and you equalize it to flat, then that would be ideal, okay? I said, okay, great, I'll go out and buy one of these heads. They're made like that. Well, that's super, I'll record with it. And to equalize the headphones, all you have to do is put the headphones on the, the head and equalize them to flat, and everything is golden, right? Well, try it. <laughs> you get the results that you just heard. Okay. There's, it just doesn't work. All right. um, it doesn't work for me. Um, but I have to say, the arguments seem reasonable. It's just that they don't work. Um, it should not be necessary to measure the sound pressure at the eardrum if, in fact, you can measure the, the sound pressure at the entrance of the ear canal and that it doesn't change when you put a headphone on. But that last part isn't correct. But blocked ear measurements became an IC standard for headphone calibration, but it doesn't achieve accurate timbre and it doesn't achieve frontal localization. Now you can correct the localization with head tracking. Your brain will say, this is crazy, but uh, I guess I can make sense of it. That doesn't fix the timbre. 
Okay, we don't have to talk about this. The reason you get these crazy things is that the ear canal is not a tube. If we go back to the diagram of Tyler and Spikowski, that's a tube for the ear canal. It ain't. Now, people model it with a tube, and you can sort of do that, but it's obviously a horn. It's a musical instrument. I have, this, this is a Bile Polka showing the entrance to my ear canal blown up a factor of five. And then that's my own castings. This is the response measured from the blocked or the unblocked ear canal uh, to the eardrum. That's the difference that you get from that resonance in that horn. It's 18 decibel boost, and it's individual. Muller and Hammershaw, I don't have time for that. Let's skip it. The reason this matters is that the ear doesn't use some sort of flexible system for determining localization. It listens to a sound, it matches it to some previously stored timbre map that it has in, in your brain, and that develops over maybe a period of a month, a week, something like that, maybe a year, I don't know. Um, but the, these patterns are stored, they're fixed. And when it finds a match, it says, oh, I know what direction that comes in, it comes from there. And knowing that direction, it can then correct it so you don't hear the timbre, okay? That second correction is really interesting and very important. I have a way of proving that, but I don't have time to describe it. You can talk to me later. Um, all right, the problem of what happens is if, okay, well, this slide says the same thing, I'll skip it. You can prove this by using time constants. I don't have time to start, uh, talk about that. Um, what happens when you put on a headphone? Well, a headphone has some response of its own by the time it gets to the eardrum, all right? And none of those patterns match. So the brain says, where is it? I don't know, I'm gonna put it up here, or maybe in there. It's not outside, because if it were outside and knew where it was, it's gotta be inside and it's probably somewhere here. And that's what you hear, but it's not right. Consequences. Um, m most tonemeisters will say, oh, I'm familiar with my studio monitors. They're great. I can always mix a great recording. I know it will be great. I'm familiar with the sound. Um, Floyd Toole proved that conclusively to be false. You mix on a, a poor set of monitors and it sounds poor. <laughs> no surprise. Okay, but that's true. But that means that if you try the, that absolute frequency mo response matters. It matters in recording. It matters in listening. All right, how do you do it? This is when I get to just how it does it. There's a non-invasive method of head bone calibration to an individual. And it's really simple. In fact, IEC publication 268-7 and German standard DIN 45619 recommended using loudness comparison using third octave noise bands instead of physical measurements for headphones. That bottom line of this is it works except that both of those standards separate, uh, specify that the source you use should be lateral. And that's silly. It has to be frontal. So all I'm doing is suggesting that you do something that's already been suggested, but you do it right, and you use a frontal speaker. Now, the, the DIN standard has said that you should play a noise band through a speaker, play it through the headphones, quickly switch them back and forth, and adjust the one on the headphone until it's equally loud. This takes a long time, it's very inconvenient. Can you do it quicker? And the answer is, of course you can do it quicker. There's an IC standard for doing equal loudness measurements. These curves that you all know, the one on the top there, is an ISO standard equal loudness test. And it says, well, you just, you, you, have, a, you have a reference tone at, five, uh, at 1,000 hertz. You play other tones alternating with the reference tone, and the subject adjusts the test tone until it's equally loud. That's a standard. I'm, I modify that simply by saying, let's use noise bands instead of tones. They're much more useful. So I have a 500 hertz uh, sharply band limited noise band, and that's my reference, and I just go through third octave bands and have the subject say, uh, it's too loud, it's too soft. That's repeatable to 1 dB for almost everybody I've tried it with. It turns out even people that are naive about sound can get it within a dB and a half repeatably. And it's important that it should be repeatable because after you get that data, you're going to take the headphones, the, the, you're to take the speaker away, put headphones on, and do it again. You'll get the loudness, equal loudness curve for the headphones on your own ears using whatever resonances they've created. And if you subtract those two curves, if you subtract the equal loudness from the speaker from the equal loudness of the headphone, 
you get the needed headphone equalization to make the headphone sound exactly like the speaker. And it does. And if you take, if you do the same for the dunning head you're recording with, if you, if you just play paint noise from the frontal speaker in front of the dummy head, then you screw around with an equalizer until it's pretty flat. If you play that recording through the headphones equalized to the frontal loudspeaker, you are there. It's absolutely startling. I have all these binaural recordings from beautiful halls all over the world. Once I do this, it takes about 20 minutes for people to get used to it and get it done. And then they are there on these gorgeous halls, and usually it just causes them to go, oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> it's mesmerizingly beautiful. Some of the halls are extraordinarily good. All right, so I wrote a Windows program that does a, this all rather quickly. I'll send it to you if you talk to me. You can try it out. Here's the results for 10 individuals at, at the, these were done at Helsinki. These are the, the, the equalization curves for four different phones. The, the picture on the, uh, the uh, left-hand side top is equal loudness data, data for some of them. And they, you can see the headphones are all over the place. These are the data you just heard from the people from RPI. Um, that's a plot of them. Comment. The, experiments, uh, the experiment is equivalent to equalizing headphones to a frontal free field response measured at the eardrum. That's what it does. Natural sounds and loudspeaker equalized recordings are intended to be heard in a room where the direct sound is frontal and dominant. That's why you use a source from the front. After individual equalization, the author's binaural recordings are perceived with frontal localization and accurate timbre. They are beautiful, they are captivating, and it's very difficult to turn them off. <coughs> now I'm going to do something. It's, I must have skipped something. I want to just give you a quick, in my last three minutes, um, of some experiments I did in this in Boston Symphony Hall. Very quick binaural measurements. I did 10 seats. I'm going to play just one of them. That's this seat in the bo bottom here called BD11. That's the bottom one here. I don't like it. I have binaural recordings in that seat of live performances. I don't like it. All right. So I, I, I did an impulse, binaural impulse response. I equalized it as I just suggested. Um, I'm not going to go into that. Um, and then I created an ensemble from that one measurement well, with the violin, uh, cello, two violins, a cello, viola, bass, and a soprano. And I played it binaurally. And I did that with MATLAB, which can, it, I just take the data and just tell MATLAB to chew on it. And I get out this, which I'm now going to play. I think I'll try playing it through the house system. Um, so I'm going to start here. I'm going to play the direct sound only. This is just the direct sound. Okay, that's enough of that. Um, you can hear there's no bass. Why is there no bass? Because there's a seat dip effect. It always absorbs the bass. Direct sound in a big concert hall like that almost never has bass, okay? Just get used to it. Um, so um, this is the first reflection. This is off the right-hand side wall. It's, it's muddy, right? It doesn't sound very good. And it's also on the right. I know you can't hear that. It's very strongly on the right, okay? Now I'm going to play um, the... Uh, <coughs> that's the first reflection. Now I'm going to play the direct sound plus the first reflection. It's muddy too. All right, now I'm going to play the reverb. The reverb has bass. Well, the reflection had bass too. Um, now I'm going to play them all together. It's muddy. This is what that seat sounds like. And this is without the first reflection. Okay, I pay fifty dollars for the seat with the first reflection. I pay a hundred dollars for that one. Okay, it really matters. 
what you can do, what you can do, this, I'm just trying to show you how powerful this is. I made one measurement in Boston, I made 10 measurements in Boston Symphony Hall in 40 minutes. And I come back, I can make each one into an ensemble, I can listen to it with and without the first reflection from the sidewall, and in every case, the first reflection was either inaudible or it was detrimental. And that's not what the textbooks say. And so if I stop there, you can read the sure. conclusions. <laughs> <laughs> Well, David, thank you very much for this, <laughs> you see, interesting presentation. Okay. Uh, okay, maybe one question, is possible? Come on, somebody. When you compare the loudness levels of the, the loudspeaker microphone and the headphone microphone for the frequency responses, how make, do you make sure that the absolute level of the reference tone is the same? Because else you will get different differences. You're absolutely right, and um, this is all a listening thing. It, it, you have to rely on the subject. So every time, you, people who've done it with me uh, will know that I say, is the loudness the same as you just heard from the speaker? If you're not sure, I'll just play the speaker again. And, and you can get that within a couple dB, which is plenty good enough. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much.